you. Well, thank, thank you three um, for agreeing to this panel. We've had a great response. Um, I was saying earlier, Jamie, 50 RSVPs, and we usually have about half of that in attendance. Mm -hmm. So I just made slides with the questions I sent you all, and we'll just go through after I, um, I have like a slide just so everyone can briefly introduce themselves. Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. Well, thank you so much for the invite. Yes. We're very excited and great turnout. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Our RSVPs, we've been, um, they've been growing uh, since we have, uh, we have a more formal web page. We have IT support. Yeah, we have Mike here. Thank you, Mike. And um, as you know, the we started this and oh, a year or two ago. So, you know, as we continue to promote, you know, each semester and students hear about it, uh, we're getting good numbers. Nice. It's good. That's good. Really good. Yeah. I know when I was um, uh, still getting my MLS, we would go, since, you know, everything was still in person back in 2004 to six, that time frame, we went yep. to different libraries and met different librarians, which was really nice. I enjoyed yeah. that. So, and my library is actually open for a visit. So if you want students to come for a visit, little tour, I'm Mary D, you can come on down, see the new space. <laughs> oh, uh, I've heard I gone to most of those for the last couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's too bad you didn't see what it looked like when we were over at the plant. Oh my, God. oh, it was just like, <laughs> I walked in there and I was just like, what? <laughs> well, thank you for mentioning that and be sure to mention it again because we do okay. have, um we still do have quite a few students in indiana and around the indianapolis area and often they have assignments you know to visit a library uh you know to observe or you know to ask questions um so that's a great opportunity we have many okay. you know asked about um you know special libraries or corporate library contacts so that's good to know okay super i'll try to remember that if i don't ah <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, that'll be interesting then. Um, Mary D, I'm not familiar with where you're from, but I don't have a library. I have, it's all virtual, it's all digital. So, um, you know, that's just another interesting aspect of a library. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, is, I don't have a physical space, <laughs> but I am the library. <laughs> yes. She's there. It's good to keep in mind. Uh-huh. How okay. a library as a space has involved and the way that we provide resources. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you know, and I've got a little quirky part of my library. Mary D's seen it. <laughs> Called petting the parts. Zoo. The petting parts. Pe the parts petting zoo. I've already petted those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. People are logging on. We'll just okay. oh, I'm not drinking bourbon. It's iced tea. <laughs> I've got water. Yeah. It's an evening panel. It's my crystal light ice. It's an evening panel. Drink up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, well, it's been an interesting week for me. I had my furnace replaced on Monday. I decided oh to finally do that, and the water heater is going to be done Friday. But it took them from 8.30 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon because it's in a tight space, you know, and they did a great job and everything. But my dog barked incessantly the entire time. That poor dog. <laughs> she's a pointer Dalmatian mix, and she's very protective of the house, you know, and she'd hear banging and voice, and she was just... And then, of course, she was apoplectic when when I had all the guys, uh, all the people coming by to offer bids and everything. And oh, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad to go into work on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's good break to mix up your, you know, scenery and uh, mm -hmm. up to the people in the hallway. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Our company's kind of 
we have a new CEO on board. So there, he just oh, started yeah. in January. Oh, yeah. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, and we had, there was an hour and a half presentation he did today. And first I was a little leery of him. I wasn't sure, you know, you always hear things through the grapevine and whatever. But I really liked his presentation and he's going to be good for the company. And uh, so I'm uh, looking forward to it. But this mandate came down that, oh, you need to be in the office three days a week. Well, I don't have to, but other people are just hemorrhaging about that. <laughs> and I said, you know, it's going to be like New Year's resolutions by March. It's all going to be different. Right. You know, you're going to realize, I mean, people are maybe more productive. And then what about the people that moved away? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, so you live in Florida now, but you're not mandated to come in three days a week. Why should I be punished? <laughs> but I don't. Yeah. And I don't have to do that. I, You know, I'm just I'm my own little island. <laughs> That's how I refer to myself. Yes. <laughs> I'm my own island. <laughs> yes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. It's nice to see more people. But. We'll see how, you know, and then the whole thing about, well, three days a week, you know, are are there data points for that showing that we've been less productive? So I don't know where that That's came. a good question. You know, the jury is still out on that. Yeah. And I sent around, I'm very, I'm very chatty on our internal, on our Yammer. <laughs> and I sent out a an article on hybrid working from, uh, is it Harvard Business Review? Why it will rain in 2023 and oh my god the commentary <laughs> back it's amazing i like that <laughs> i always i always put things out there that get people yeah. chatting <laughs> but you know I, th I think that's one of the things that that we learn years ago in special libraries is the importance of communication yeah when people can't see you so right you have to become visible in other ways mm -hmm. oh yeah. we're very good at that yeah because if we're not good at that we're in the wrong profession. Mm -hmm. And we have the wrong employer, or both. But yes. <laughs> One or the other. One or the other, yeah. yeah. Or both, yeah, yeah. If, mm -hmm. if you work remotely, you, you have to make an effort to be seen. Yeah. And I, it's on Yammer that's still being seen. Yep. Oh, yeah. And I do all kinds of stuff now. I mean, I have to tell you, when, when COVID came on, it were, suddenly, you know, it's like, uh, what do I do now? And I've really pivoted to being mm -hmm. more, uh, my marketing efforts have really yeah. paid off now. So, mm -hmm. well, I think that word pivot is, is absolutely critical to what we do. Yeah. Uh, if librarians just well, within special libraries, because things are affecting academics and publics as well, right. but this ability to kind of mm -hmm. you know, read the tea leaves and say, okay, I, I need to change direction here I, yeah you, you just can't keep going the same way you've been going for the last 10 years doesn't work no you know and that's the same way in a lot of businesses and Absolutely. and everything and it, it's like and if you're not evolving and changing with the times your business is going to go by the wayside you know it's right. like and then if you're not thinking differently i mean when you think about some of the new things that have happened They've come from resources that, or from things that you would never think of, you know, like Amazon yeah. and eBay and a lot of the eBooks and journals and, and all of this stuff came from people yeah. who were outside that particular profession. Yep. And so I try to pick things up wherever I can. Like, ooh. Never oh. We are, uh, okay. At time, we can go ahead and get started. We have a good number long gone, 28 um, folks. Well, Ted, thank you all so much for joining. I'll do my um, you know, formal intro, and then we'll start asking questions. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Lydia Spots, and I am a lecturer for Library and Information Science in the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering. We just changed our name this month. No, sorry, <laughs> Remember, and I, I wore our new logo today. <laughs> 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 
it's hard not to uh, go back to old habits but uh, yeah this is our monthly library um industry speaker series and this month in january we're kicking off with a special libraries panel uh so we have three speakers for each night gabby mary d and jamie and i will moderate and ask questions but students you are welcome to raise your hand uh you know and as we go along, you know, if something occurs to you, you can put it in the chat, raise your hand. We will also, you know, have time at the end. Um, so first, if I can, there we go, get my slides going. Um, with each catalyst, uh, we can just go in the order, uh, you know, gapping to Jane. Would you just briefly introduce yourselves, please? Uh, Gabby High Song, Gabrielle High Song. I am the corporate librarian for Rolls Royce. Rolls-Royce Aerospace. Rolls-Royce doesn't own the car anymore. They haven't for several decades now, but we share the logo. And I am a solo librarian for a company of 45,000 employees. And I've been there since, I've been there now 16 years. Thanks. Mary D? Um, well, I started out in life. <laughs> as a corporate librarian for Bank America in San Francisco and pivoted multiple times and am now the editor for three separate publications, Online Searcher for librarians, ILI 365E News, which is mostly for Europeans, although we call it international, but most people who read it are from Europe. And just added to my portfolio is KM World, which is all about knowledge management. Uh, in addition to that, I do program planning for a bunch of conferences, including computers and libraries, internet librarian, uh, enterprise search, and data summit. I could go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> and Jamie. All right. I am Jamie Hollinger, and I am the senior corporate librarian for a company called Zimmer Biomet. Um, Zimmer Biomet is a medical device manufacturer. So if you know anybody who has a new hip or new knee, probably made by my company. Um, I've been there for just about five years now, and I'm the solo librarian for a global company with 20 plus sites and about 30,000 employees. So, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of people for solo librarians. <laughs> yeah. 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 Jamie and I are busy. Yes, we are. <laughs> Okay. Um, so our first question this evening, and I'll just let each of you, you know, speak in turn, however you feel moved um, to order yourselves. What led you to pursue library science, information science work, and earn your MLS or MLIS? And did your plans or objectives change during the course of your study? Well, I guess I'll start since we're kind of going in order. Um, I have an undergrad degree in public health with a concentration in environmental science, and I worked for a hazmat company for over 10 years, and I was their safety and compliance manager for their transport division. And I did that. I really enjoyed that. I mean, the 49 CFR was my Bible, and I did a lot <laughs> of teaching and training, whether it was for truck drivers on how to transport hazardous waste to our customers when I would stand in front of a group of 300 people and train and teach about hazmat regs to senior executives, et cetera. And I really enjoyed that. And then I, I moved to another company. I wanted to kind of expand myself and go into kind of like sales. But the company, it didn't turn out very well. The company wasn't well run. And I was, you know, very disappointed. And it was just one day I was sitting at work and it was like the clouds parted, the angels sang, and it was like an epiphany. And I'm not a religious person, but it was like, go to library school, become a librarian. And I called up a friend that was the medical librarian at IU Med School. And I said, Carol, guess what? I want to be a librarian. And she's like, that is so great. Let's have lunch with the dean. And at that time, the school was separate. So this was like 2003. And we had lunch. And he's like, oh, you're Rand. Because, you know, I'd gone to IUPUI uh, 
And uh, so I started grad school in January of 2004. I had sold my dream house. I started all over again. I sold my dream house. I, you know, quit my job, moved from a beautiful home in Irvington to a one-bedroom apartment to go to grad school. And I did that. And I didn't know if I would get a job. I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure about anything. I was just, here I am. And it never dawned on me in my previous life to ever become a librarian. I mean, I love libraries and books, but it never dawned on me. And while I was doing my work, I wanted to be a medical library. Oh, I always got so excited when I'd see like a new book in the medical library. It's like, oh, look at this book on skin diseases. I love it. This is so cool. And I, I real, and I, all my studies and all my work was towards medical librarianship. And so I was hoping to work in that field. And how I ended up at Rolls Royce was I was doing some contracting work to catalog their library. And this was when the library was still at the plant and it was, it was the most, it was so awful looking. And there's a whole nother history to that. But I, it was just supposed to be a two month position to kind of catalog the library. But the librarian who had hired me as a contractor wanted to do other stuff in the company. So they kept extending my contract to do other things in the library to help with, you know, engineers and and other things in the library. And by the time I got my MLS, so it was two years later, you either have to, Rolls-Royce has the policy that you either have to hire your contractor or you let them go. And uh, since the librarian wanted to go into other things within Rolls Royce, I got hired, and it suddenly it was just like, what do what do engineers need? So, it was a whole different kind of ball game. Um, but I mean, the searching, but is still the same. Finding resources, but it's different types of resources, and what medical librarians and physicians and clinical staff need is a lot different from what engineers need. So I guess I'll end it there, but nothing changed while I was doing my studies. It just changed when I got a job, you know, and I got a great offer from Rolls Royce. It was like, okay, I'll take it. And it was only supposed to last a year because the library was destined for closure. It was, it was awful. Rolls Royce purchased Allison Engine back in the 90s. And so they were transitioning and the library was kind of under the radar and it was dusty and dirty and filled with cobwebs and the ceiling leaked and nothing new in there since the mid nineties. And it was, I mean, nothing online even in 2006, I was shocked. So I, um, I said, okay, if nothing else, I'll get a year of experience in under my belt and then I'll go find a job elsewhere. And 16 years later, I'm still with Rolls-Royce, and now they consider the library an essential business resource. So I'm thrilled to death. And every day I wake up and I go, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. So that's how that turned out. That's a beautiful story. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mary, do you, do you like to go next? Sure. <clears throat> well, my origin story is totally different from Gabby's. Um, I actually started working in public libraries uh, when I was a teenager, um, I was a page, you know, I shelved books. And my father said, when do you get promoted to a chapter? He thought that was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to university, majored in English, uh, and worked in a library because that was all I knew how to do. Um, and then I uh, worked in two different uh, academic libraries, uh, Stanford and West Virginia University. Uh, this has to do with where my husband was. This was not really my choice, but it worked out just fine. So in West Virginia, I was running a department. I reported directly to the director, and I didn't have an MLS. West Virginia, it's a state university, so the salaries are set by the state. And that meant I wasn't making very much money because it was, it, it looked like a professional position, but it actually was not. It was a a professional position. And so I said, well, I think I'll go to library schools. I went to the University of Pittsburgh. That's the library school. 
And to answer your question about what changed, uh, two things changed drastically uh, when I was in library school. The first one was I suddenly discovered special libraries. I had no idea. I had experience with publics and academics. I didn't know corporations had libraries. I didn't know museums had libraries. So that was just mind blowing. And I said, this is, this is it, man. This is what I really want to do. And the second thing was online information was just getting started at the time. So it, it was really a revolution in how you looked up and found relevant information. So that was great. Um, my husband had accepted a job in California, and uh, the guidance person at Pitt said, uh, well, now, what are your plans? And I said, well, I'm moving to San Francisco. I'm going to get a job. And he said, you can't get a job in San Francisco. And I thought that was extremely helpful. <laughs> um, so I moved, and as it turned out, there was a professional conference in town, and one of my professors was there. He said, well, let's get together, and... He showed me where the job board was, and there was a job advertised. So I called, and the director of that library, corporate library, said, uh, I am absolutely swamped. I don't have time to talk to you. Are you around? And I said, yes, I'm not here just for the conference. I live here. She said, oh, great. And so I interviewed the next week and was hired pretty much on the spot. Mm -hmm. Selling my nose at the guidance person back in the <laughs> Never mind. Uh, uh, so I uh, ended up running the library for Bank America and left after 10 years and moved to Kansas. Uh, in case you've never been to Kansas, it, it doesn't really have a lot of large multinational banks. Yeah. So I thought, well, time to pivot. So I uh, started my own business. So I went into business as an independent researcher and... That worked very well um, until I moved to Europe, at which point it, it worked reasonably well. I also did a lot of consulting and contracting for a very large information, online information company. Moving back to the U.S., I said, well, this whole research thing, it's fun, but I think I need to pivot again. And so I took on the job of editing online magazine. I did that for years, and then the company that owned it was sold to another company. So I now work for Information Today, Inc., and have taken on all kinds of other positions. As I said earlier, I'm editing now three publications, uh, organizing conferences. Uh, and the other thing that I did right around, it, it sort of in conjunction with all this other stuff, um, I also was an adjunct professor for three different library schools. Uh, Started out at Berkeley, uh, did the uh, adjunct courses for the University of Missouri, and taught the business information and resources class for IUPUI, which is how I met Gabby, because <laughs> she was my student. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that no end. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think the, the, what, I, what I've taken away from the whole thing is that if you're interested in alternative careers, if it's not public libraries, it's not academic libraries, uh, look around, look broadly, and be willing to pivot mm -hmm. and be willing to sell yourself because that's really what it's all about. I mean, that's, I would go to places and say, hi, even at the bank, I, I would go to places and say, hi, I'm your librarian. How can I help you? I, I had people tell me that no one had ever asked them that before. Kind of amazing. Sell yourself. Jamie. <laughs> um, so very similar origin story, Mary D. Um, I started out as a page at my local library at 16. <laughs> my mom came home with a job application and said, fill this out. You're there all the time anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but basically, um, as my, as I rose through school, so, um, like when I graduated high school, I was commuting to a college nearby, so I was able to go from page to clerk more hours. And then um, one month after graduating college, I started full-time as a library assistant um, and started my MLIS. So um, I worked all the way through 
and I ended my public library career as a youth services librarian. Um, but I think when I was starting graduate school, I had fully intended to continue being in public libraries. Um, it wasn't until about halfway through my program um, that I decided to do a summer abroad in England. Um, so I have a history background. That's what my undergrad is in. So um, just always been very interested in museums and things like that. And so I met my um, now mentor, who was my professor during that time. And she looked at me and said, you don't belong in a public, I mean, you do, you're, you're good at public library, but you really should just start exploring other coursework that would support doing other things. So I added in a graduate certificate in archives and special collections um, and still managed to graduate on time. But working full time at the same time was not not fun, but it was doable. So um, I, I did, you know, kind of change my my intended out outcome with my degree um, halfway through the program. Um, and it proved to be a really great decision. So I. I encourage just like kind of seeing what other options are out there because you just never know. Thank you all. I'm always so intrigued to hear about people's paths and the way that they have pivoted. Our next question for this evening is, uh, well, you know, I think we already kind of covered this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of, kind of, yeah. Disregard by uh, stock photos of paths. <laughs> next one. Uh, well, I could I could talk about career because, you know, when I got on with Rolls Royce, nobody wanted, you know, I, I took a, I was taking a cataloging class and I remember the first three weeks of the cataloging, two, two or three weeks of the cataloging class. I'm like, what is she talking about? This is, she, doesn't make any sense. And then it finally, and then just the, the little light bulb came on and I go, this is like the federal regulations, except the it's the AACR too. And they needed somebody to catalog their library. And people were like, oh, I don't want to catalog. I don't want to be a cataloger. And I was still in the Netherlands in Amsterdam on vacation. And I emailed back to the librarian because it was on the listserv. I said, can you wait another day before you interview? Because I'll gladly catalog your library. And sure enough, she did. So sometimes, you know, if opportunity's knocking at your door and you're like, ah, oh, you know, you're not quite sure, don't say nobody's home. Just open the door, you know, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I'm a firm believer and it's like, oh, yeah, go for it. And that's what that's how I managed to get my foot into Rolls Royce and to, I don't know, sway everybody that I should become their librarian. <laughs> so. That's kind of one of those things. Look for those jobs that are posted that are kind of like, I don't know if I really, you know, if you really want to do it, it's like, go ahead, do it, do it, you know, and maybe off the wall internships. You never know. Actually, that, that job that I walked into at the bank was a cataloging job. <laughs> and it was not a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it was interesting because you have... So much more freedom in a corporate library. Nobody's looking over your shoulder and saying, did you get the wrong cutter number? Who yeah. cares? Nobody Ex cares. Exactly. I mean, in Abby and I's situation, we're solo librarians, so there's nobody. To check yeah. Out. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's nobody like. Nobody cares. As long as they can find the material, that's all that matters. We had, we had a whole section. We used to get uh, annual reports from all the national banks around the world some of which came to the library literally with three guys with guns uh, from a Briggs truck. Why they thought the annual report of the National Bank of, I don't know, Zambia was all that important, I had no idea. But it was always sort of a shock when these guys would walk in with their guns. And it's just, you know, this small little annual report. <laughs> but we, we, uh, we cataloged those geographically. Yeah. So the whole section started out continent and then within continent by individual country yeah. and and so we wouldn't do things like oh you're you're looking for cheryl uh i i think she takes at the moment maybe she was around the corner mm -hmm. yep thank you so cataloging i guess <laughs> 
catalogy will get you in. I was actually glad to leave the catalogy position. <laughs> So our next question, I would love for each of you to kind of briefly share, you know, and this can be the, um, uh, you know, high level view, you know, what's in, what's in day like, um, and how's that different than, you know, what people anticipate standard library roles in a public or an academic library might be like, um, and, and what are some key ways to find yourself using your um, LIS training or coursework? Well. For me, a typical day, I'm a solo librarian, so, and as Jamie knows, and as Mary D knows, every day is different. Um, I, when I'm working, I work hybrid, you know, we, we add the lockdown, and, and then um, I work two days a week in the library, one day, it just depends, because I have Zoom meetings, they're not allowed on our work computers because we are a Department of Defense contractor and everything is so secure and Zoom is insecure, <laughs> according to them. So um, I work from home and I'll get up, you know, 6.30 in the morning, cup of coffee. I check to see if there are emails from the UK. I get emails from around the world, mm -hmm. you know, Europe, India, China, Singapore. They want information. So I'll answer those emails. And usually when I'm on site, because I have two huge monitors at my in my space, um, I'll do my website work where I have a lot of windows open and a lot of multitasking. But I do interlibrary loans, whether it's articles and books. I manage the budget for the library. I do the collection development. I do cataloging. If I get hard copy books in, I negotiate with my vendors. Mm -hmm. I do the marketing. I do training. I do schmoozing. I manage the parts petting zoo in our library. And it's just, it's like every day is fun. Every day it's different. I, and I have meetings with other teams because I like to be a part of groups because since I'm solo, it's like uh, I need to know what's going on within the company, especially since we're hybrid. When we were all on site, everyone used to come down to the library. It was like the social event center of, of Rolls Royce. But now with, with hybrid work, you don't see as many people and uh, it's it's just not as... as um, you know, just not as many people coming into the library. So I kind of walk around. I ask to join people's meetings. When I meet someone and I go, oh, I'd love to be a part of your meeting. So I know what's going on within the company. I, you know, I tell them I, I won't offer any advice. You know, it's not like you need, need to hear from me, but I'd like to know what's going on within the company. I'm also involved in some employee resource groups. Uh, I am on the um, communications committee for um, our the abilities group. It's a disabilities uh, a, a ERG. And then I'm the subject matter expert for our intranet. Now I do the library's website and all its pages, but people come to me and they ask me questions. They're like, how do I do this? How do I do that? Because we just... Um, I just happen to be the subject matter expert on that. I do purchasing. I will purchase things for other departments. People are like, oh, I need privacy screens now. So I so nobody can see my export controlled, uh, you know, information on the computer or I need such and such. And I go, I'll do it. I'll take care of that for you. I'm the Koopa queen. I know how to handle that internal system. And um, so it's it's always... It's always something different, and I have a tendency to say, I'll take care of that for you. Not that I'm overloading myself, but I'm just making myself indispensable to the company. <laughs> you know, it's like, Whoa. Yeah, me, I do the same thing. I will yeah. order your office supplies yes. because you will come for me for other things, and that yes. leads to other conversations. It sure does. And so, and they're like, you can do that. You can take care of that. And I go, fine. And I'm like the IT expert. I mean, I love my engineers and they're brilliant, but some of them cannot find their way out of a paper bag. 
And when it comes to accessing databases, it's like, well, this doesn't work. And it's like, here, let me fix that for you. Let me get that. And the tagline on my business card and my email says, if you can't find what you need in 10 minutes, call the librarian. And a lot of people have taken that to heart. And they're just like, how did you find that? I go, it's mad search skills. I'm a librarian. It's my job. I'm your search Sherpa. Think of me as your <laughs> Sherpa taking you up Mount Everest of knowledge. We'll do all that hard labor. I'll take care of base camp, the ropes, the lines. You can have the glory at the top. Just remember who got you there. Otherwise, I'm pulling your oxygen tanks. <laughs> you know? and, and then they get it, and then they understand it. And that's how I do my elevator speech to our our senior executives i'm not afraid to go and schmooze with them so if they're in town they're in the building i'm like hi and i tell them how much you know my return on investment and how i save them money so and you know it's um and you really really an important part of, of corporate librarianship i think is marketing and selling yourself and i know jamie it's like if you don't do that, if you're just quiet, that's it. You're, yeah. you're, they're going to go, you know, what's the point in having you? Yeah, but Dammy, you've also got an interesting job title that you made up. Information operative is what I call myself. <laughs> I've always been one of my favorites. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, yeah, I can find information. Because people are like, how did you find that? And I go, well... Uh, you know, after doing this for 16 years now, I'm getting pretty good. And then I also remind them, even though I'm a solo librarian, I have access to hundreds of librarians globally. I am not alone. So, and then they're like, oh yeah, great. That's cool. So yeah. And I under promise and over deliver. Oh, and then that's, that's very important. important. That's very oh, yeah. important. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, sorry. I'm just too chatty here. Oh, that's not <laughs> I was like a, just a dynamic and rewarding day. And yes, I was going to say earlier, you definitely made yourself indispensable. <laughs> um, they are so important. And I, I think you yeah. need to keep that in mind. There are things maybe you should do that are maybe not quite the role. On the other hand, yeah, I mean, I had, I had a woman who worked for me at the bank and she was bilingual, English and French, and people figured that out. And they would come to her and say, could you translate this thing for me? And she would always say yes and did it. And uh, she left actually to move to France. And coincidentally, the woman I hired to replace her was not bilingual, but French was a second language. And so people came to get translations. And all of a sudden, I realized that people thought that was part of the official job. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. that woman had left... I would have been confronted with a real dilemma. Do I hire somebody with French or do I try and make it clear to people that this is not in the job description? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. There's some things, you know, for a while there I had, you know, uh, librarians that would help me or assist me in intern or statement of work. And I would do more stuff. There's stuff I don't do anymore. Nobody notices that I don't do it anymore. Because that was just, you know, that was small potatoes, icing on the cake. You know, I do a Pareto analysis, the 80-20 rule, boom. What, you know, the biggest bang for my buck. And all that other stuff, nothing. You know, shelf count, eh. overdue books, eh. The only overdue books I'm worried about are interlibrary loans. You know, everything else, eh. right. you know, I just sent out a reminder. You still right. have this book. There's just stuff that you just don't do anymore in the big scheme of things and nobody notices that and other things have just gone by the wayside we used to do laptop loans and cell phones in the library because everybody had a desktop they needed a laptop for travel well now everyone's got a laptop and everybody's got a cell phone so that whole program went away and that was nice you know and some stuff I would talk to my manager and I go this should fall under the purview of IT and I've had great senior managers, and they're like, okay, sure. <laughs> and that worked. Yeah. I'll just expand on that, Gabby, because for me, taking over the job that I did, the person had been there for about 15 years. Yeah. And I learned that there was a lot of things that had just not been kept up with. So we're a global company. 
and you know digital resources are paramount for that mm -hmm. and so the library was only being used by the headquarters um site mm -hmm. which is warsaw indiana and so it was like the library is here we do have some you know like uh digital resources but that had not been advertised to the rest of the company so now that i'm five years in it's like I've, the library is booming because, you know, mm -hmm. kind of redoing how everything was accessed and um, promoting, you know, because people didn't realize that there even was a librarian. So yeah. as Gabby said, I've been exhaustively and shamelessly promoting myself. I've had people because like we have um, like an internal website for the company and they do an employee spotlight and somebody um, had asked me to take part. And so I enthusiastically, yes. People were emailing me because they got so tired of getting notifications from Yammer that my article was trending a month after it had been put on there. <laughs> so because people yeah. kept commenting on the post, Jamie's yeah. great. Jamie's so helpful. She's just so, you know, like, and it's just like they were so sick of hearing about me. And, you know. <laughs> so, but that's great for me. Yeah. Like, that's exactly what it should be because, you know, like, yeah, you know, I mean, you, I've been able to make the job what I've saw it needs to be okay. and being in a corporate space and being solo i have the luxury of being able to make that call and be yeah. able to take it in the direction that i want yep. so, yeah yeah well, i guess what i have in yeah. common with the two of you is the international piece of it yeah i've always been international yeah. uh the bank of course was very international <laughs> and and we would get all kinds of fascinating questions. And when I would always tell employees when when we had new hires, when we were onboarding, I'd say, you know, please be as specific as possible when you ask a question because if someone in Australia asks about the wine industry and somebody in California asks about the wine industry, you give them very, very different answers based on where they are and what their position is within the company. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's an interesting thing that I think all three of us have said, well, we pretty much start our day early in the morning checking yeah. email because when those people have come in from their time zones, which are not our time zones. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have to allow overlap. First thing in the morning and age yep. the last thing at night. So yeah. you, you know, yeah. have to understand time zones. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that that's what I do. And, you know, my day in the day in the life is, is really different for the two of you because although we start with email, then I'm looking for uh, potential authors. And if any of the students on this call are interested in writing for Online Searcher, Paul are because I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, so I'm looking for that. I'm looking for conference presenters. I'm writing things myself. I'm editing. And it is absolutely astonishing to me how some really 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 intelligent people can't write their way out of a paper bag oh no they can't and then i get into arguments with my copy editor about commas this is always exciting <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, oh yeah i also started moderating webinars which is loads of fun and i've become quite familiar with zoom Mm -hmm. for better or for worse <laughs> yeah you no know, but one of the things that that i really need to probably do more of is is keep up with the new developments in technology and if any of you have mm -hmm. not started playing around with chat gpt where have you been oh. of that is taking over the world i think mm -hmm. and i i think honestly some of the artificial intelligence technologies machine learning uh textual analysis, all of these uh, technologies are going to have a massive effect on our profession. And I think it's going to probably hit the other world to a mm -hmm. greater degree than it will hit public libraries or academic libraries. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. That's true. I have to get more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, um, I've, I've been... Uh, uh, I had been chatting with some Purdue librarians, and I think one area, and this is kind of maybe a little off topic, is how corporate librarians and academic librarians can interface better 
especially with mm -hmm. you know new orientation uh uh anytime you're doing uh, instruction because you get some of these students coming out of school and it just depends on the field that they're going into and then they go to work for a corporation and the corporation may not have a library it's like whoa guess yeah. what you don't have a library or you you know our corporate library doesn't have the same type of access that purdue does or virginia tech so guess what you can't get those resources as easily and also it's funny like engineers usually don't do any library work until they're working on their masters and that is kind of funny because they'll come into the library and go what's the difference between a journal and a trade publication you know and and so some things just are so basic because some undergrad degrees don't require library use or very minimal and then once they start working on a master's program then they're like oh and yeah and there's some terrible writing that comes from engineers i'm like whoa that, what are you trying to say to me <laughs> really yeah it's 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 funny. I mean, there are some, they're great writers. They get published and others are just, nope, you're never going to get that published. Well, you don't know if they're a great writer just because they got published. True, that is true. On the back end, oh. something else <laughs> happened. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> don't want to erase your labor, Mary D. <laughs> it's, it's you, yeah. I think it's a good point. Um, in, in the business world, uh, we uh, we have business libraries that have a tremendous number of online resources, and the librarians at places like Cranert, at places like IU, go out of their way to teach undergraduates how to use these, to teach the MBA students how to use all these things. Mm -hmm. And they graduate, and they get a job, and boom, all this stuff is gone. Yeah. They don't have access anymore. Mm -hmm. And... Yep. it's it's a it's a real issue yeah yeah that you know it's it's like there uh, some of these vendors are like drug dealers here we'll give it to you really cheap you know that's why all the all the uh, lawyers want west law and you go to work for a law firm what do you mean you don't have west law and it's like well you know they gave it away <laughs> as where and yeah and that's usually what I do too when I want to try out a new database. I'm like, oh, can you give me a free trial for a while? <laughs> Get my engineers addicted. This is trick and you know information to think about how your audience, your designated audience that you're serving, is different in corporate context and what their field specific education might have been like and how that impacts their yeah. their school library, their ability to navigate. You know, yeah. Library resources. Yeah. Speaking from somebody who, you know, yeah. with my company, we have engineers, we have marketing, we have law, we have um, a, a number of like clinical medical writers. We have a very large base of different kinds of jobs that would be utilizing the library, and none of them know how to use a database. <laughs> yes, yeah. no, none of them like it. Wow. wow. So it's it's honestly a lot like getting those freshmen in, you know, in an academic library every year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. some people do take to it, but for the most part, like people just like it's very much that is one of the key things that you would need to look for when you're shopping, you know, a, a database or a vendor is just intuitive. It needs to be intuitive because yeah. it, especially being solo, I can't teach every person how to do something or do it for them. So it needs to be something that can be easily navigated by them on their own. So, yeah. yeah. Just intuitive to an engineer might not be intuitive to a marketing person. Yeah, so you have to make it as middle ground as you can because, I mean, it is. It's like, so, I mean, if there's something that's very familiar, like, is in terms of, like, online shopping, like, I manage a platform that is, um, it unifies all of my journal subscriptions. And when you shop for a journal article, it is exactly like shopping Amazon. You pick it, you put yeah. it in your basket, you check out. Like that's like you search what you want. So mm -hmm. and there you go. <laughs> like that's yeah. easy. So um, uh -huh. it's just amazing what you realize, especially if you're not doing the traditional path 
Um, I'll kind of get more on topic of like, you know, exploring like everything. But if you're yeah. going to be looking into doing something with your degree, then you're not going to go the traditional path of, you know, academic or public. It, you know, like it's very um, important to realize that there's going to be a lot of things that you probably are going to have to figure out yourself. But you're very mm -hmm. capable. I promise every single person on this call, you are capable of doing that because there are so many things that I will be like, I wish I would have learned that in library school. I wish I would have taken a business class to help me learn how to negotiate contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, because most yeah. of my most of my time is negotiating contracts. You know, yeah. contracts. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, contracts. I almost I almost like puked when I saw the number on that paper yeah. because I just was like, Are you sure you want me handling a million dollars? Like it's um oh, I know. <laughs> and it's scary um but yep. that's my job so yeah um, but yeah, it, I, I i think that's a that's another key point though that if you were not in a corporate setting if you were say in an academic library they would have one person that's their entire job yes mm -hmm. contract negotiation whereas when you get into the corporate world we all wear so many different mm -hmm. hats and yeah. we do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you know it, it, now that you put up question four here <laughs> yeah you know is there a demand for corporate librarians in a particular industry i would say that the industry doesn't matter very much no yeah. but i would also say that in in the corporate world there's always been a bit of a problem with the word librarian and i think to some extent it's becoming more problematic as the jobs change and so we talked about being a cataloger. Well, now we're a metadata manager. Uh -huh. And we have to phrase what we do in those terms. Phrase your skill set in corporate terms. What is a corporation looking for? They're looking for metadata. They're looking for technology. They're looking for knowledge management. Uh -huh. uh, they're looking for some soft skills along with the hard skills do we do reference uh -huh. or do we do research? We do uh -huh. research. We That's exactly. Reference. Yeah. Yeah. Information but, specialist, I would say, would be another key phrase there. You're, you're not. Like information I said at the bank. You know what I found out? Information specialist in bank lingo was data entry. Oh. The lowest level position you could find within the IT department. So you have to look at what are yeah. the job titles within your company? Mm -hmm. And make sure that you don't undervalue yourself. Right. Yeah. 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 Because I yeah. actually, I actually created my own job title. I re, I changed it. Yeah. Midway through because it was just not aligning with what I was doing, but it was just what the job had always had. So as I evolved, I was able to change my job title. And what is it? It is like I am senior corporate librarian because before I was just research librarian, but. I serve the corporation, so I'm the corporate librarian. Yes. So it was aligning with my not just serving a department like it was before I was serving the entire company. Yeah. So. Yeah, m mine has evolved, too. You know, I moved from Indianapolis to where I just served Indianapolis. Then I, I schmoozed with marketing and was able to expand the website that I initially designed to serve North America. And then it went global a few years ago, oh, probably 10 years now. Yeah. Time time flies whether you're having fun or not. <laughs> and uh, so I just, you know, I call, you know, I'm the corporate librarian. I'm your information operative, whatever works. And I use the terminology that our company uses. Yeah. So, yeah, you have That's to easy. use that. Because the first time I weeded the library, I said, I'm weeding the library. And they said, what are you, closing the library? So now I 5S, that's a quality term. And I use all of, I use the engineering terminology. I use the terminology that Rolls-Royce uses. And I don't, you know, yeah, I do research. I, you know, I. A support, a marketing, and mm -hmm. and all of that other fun stuff. So yeah, use the terminology that the corporation is looking for, and don't say, "Well, I'm a librarian." Yeah, I mean, I like the word librarian in there. It kind of 
it gives them some sense, but at the same time, too, my job has evolved greatly from when I first mm -hmm. came on board to it was just books in the library. Yeah, and bring your own, like, just the way that you feel a library should be run. One of the mm -hmm. most common compliments that I get from everyone, especially because they were there when my predecessor was there, is they were very glad to have a friendly face representing the library. Because I yeah. brought my public library customer service mindset in. Yes. And that has been very welcomed because yes. that can-do attitude that's, you know, kind of driving my, you know, just shameless plugging of myself. <laughs> like it's, yeah. you know, bringing myself, and they're much more willing to approach me or to have me on. Yeah. So I, I do say like, if there's certain skill sets, like even if you're going from, you know, one kind of library to another, you're going to be bringing that with you. And customer service by far has been the most, you yeah. know, one that I've brought with me from my past. And I will say the, that question there, I think is very important to answer the hiring process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's going to be a long time for both of those. <laughs> it's going to take a very long time for you to um, hear back. I actually had kind of given my job um, that I have now as a loss because it had been months before I heard back. Months. <laughs> so just know that it's, it's probably going to take a long time um, doing that application process because government and corporate sectors have a very different hiring process than say a public library um there's a bureaucratic thing that you got to go through and um i think it was probably about five months before i find like from my application submission to job acceptance um and it can be very discouraging but you know if you want um if you want to do it, then you, you just have to accept that. So just know that that's probably going to be a very different process going forward, joining that. That's yeah. interesting, Jamie, because my experience was very different. Really? Yeah. Not, well, I mean, I, this, I mean, when, when did you do Bank of America? Well, it was a while ago, but, but well, yeah, but, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. There's just so many hoops. I mean, like I had several HR people that, you know, did different stages of interview before I even got to the person who was going to be my manager, like face to face. Interesting. Yeah. yeah and that's, that, been, and that's been the people that I've spoken with too. their experience, like corporate has, it was a very long process as well, because the thing is, is that they all run by a budget. And so, uh -huh. You know, they if the money is not there, they can't offer you a job. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So I mean, there's different things that you kind of have. And I did a fellowship after I did a postgraduate fellowship for um, DOD, um, mm. just outside of DC with the um, Army Technical Library. So it was like they were making weaponry, so quantum physicists and mm -hmm. lots of very interesting people I met there. But I mean, even that process. Um, I took a long time for my application before I finally got the letter saying you're, you're in. So that's been my experience. Yeah. That's good to know because I always, yeah, advise that government, especially federal government can take forever, but yeah, federal government. Yeah. Better. Like corporate, it seems like it would be quicker than academia, but I guess not. <laughs> it depends. It, on, it depends. Yeah. On, yeah. yeah. It depends on the company and it depends on to a certain extent, it depends. I, I go back to this thing about redefining the job titles. Mm -hmm. Of it might take longer if you say I'm a librarian than if you say I mm -hmm. am a metadata specialist. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. It was just like, oh, they wrote the job description just for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, they did. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know what they, you know, people like, oh, are you going to retire? I go, uh-uh. I love what I do, and it keeps me very sharp mentally. And uh, what the company would do after I'm gone, I don't know. You know, I mean, corporations, you know, they, they can just go willy-nilly. You know, our company has been doing reorgs for years and years and years, you know, and people are getting tired of it. And I've been very fortunate in that I kind of fall, I fall under the defense group 
which is making money hand over fist, unlike the civil portion of our business, which is like bleeding money. And uh, so I've been really fortunate in that I've been shuffled around to different groups, but I've always had these great managers. So, and they just, and they leave me alone. They don't micromanage me. They go, mm -hmm. I know what you're doing. And I only bother them. Well, I don't bother them. It's like, if I am having a problem here and I'm not getting any traction from another group or I need some assistance, then I'll yeah. get my senior man, my manager involved. But it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a low maintenance employee yeah. and, and lately, you know, I, I'm at a certain age now. It's like, you know what? I'm going to ask for forgiveness before I ask for permission. Yep. And I, you know, and there were some things that it's like, guess what? I'm putting in a federated search tool. Guess what? We got money for that. You know, <laughs> and it's like, you know, I mean, I, I just kind of go back to the Rolls Royce, to our principles, our operating principles, our guiding values. I always throw that back in their face, <laughs> you know? Yeah. When it comes to ethics and other things, it's like, hmm. oh, isn't this principle number seven that we're supposed to be following? Yeah, so, I think that I, yeah. that's something that's very important because in a corporate world, it is very different. Mm -hmm. And I can say, you know, kind of going along with what Gabby mentioned there, you know, like you you got to kind of move with the flow of your business. And so, yeah. you know, like they, they bought out another business and so they merged a business. Mm -hmm. Now they have rework. And um, I've been here five years now with my company. And for the first three years, I had a new boss every year. And then I had to start over and, t and I was still learning myself. So it's just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I'm still learning the ropes of what my job is supposed to be. And I already have a different boss. So it's yeah. like, what am I supposed to do? And so, and then last year we actually spun off um, three divisions of our company to have them start their own business. So then I had to separate out everything from contract. Oh. I mean, it's just like, there's so many different things that yeah. you have, like that you just never would have thought that you have to learn or yeah. even think about. And the library or not. Yep. So the library. Is it? Because we acquire companies. Uh, and then it yeah. Was... And we acquire companies too. And then I don't know that we yeah. have a new company because they don't necessarily always share that. And so then I have people calling me from like this, you know, part of the country that like, we don't have business there, do we? Who are you? Yeah. Oh, we do. We just yeah. bought new technology. So now we yeah. have their company and their people. So you're part of Zimmer Biomet now. And yeah, so now I yeah. have to go back and go, okay, we, you know, like, is this what's due? Yeah. So, we have, um, oh. you know, we, we had an etiquette question because we acquired a, another major bank that had a library. And so the etiquette question is, do I call her or does she call me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Apparently, uh, we were both sitting there by the phone saying, just wondering who was going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I finally called her. Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah. See, I'm the only, you know, people are shocked. They're like, the only librarian. I go, oh, yeah, baby. You guys closed all your libraries elsewhere. But, you know, one thing I, I don't know if it's changed now because I don't know what the coursework in LIS is these days, but return on investment. Now yeah. I learned that early on because I was in safety and compliance and public health. And it's like, mm -hmm. how do you show your value when you've prevented something? And so I learned early on to show my return on investment when I worked in the corporate world. Absolutely. And because that's that, how you got to hit the ground running doing that as the librarian and as the information operative or information specialist, whatever you do, return on investment. And I mean, that is really important. And, and, and I wish I had gotten that. Um, I, I had learned about, you know, negotiating with vendors, you know, electronic databases and everybody, you know, the old days of, oh, I buy a book and it's twenty nine ninety five, and I can get it on Amazon. Now everybody negotiate, you know, it's like every vendor, they look and they go, ooh, this is Rolls Royce. Maybe I can charge them this amount of money yeah, for a data. And then I go, you know, I don't have that kind of money. 
And then they're like, oh, but I'd like to have the Rolls Royce account. I know that's what they're thinking. And so there's that kind of negotiating back and forth. You want to say, I got Rolls Royce, and but I want it for a certain price. And, you know, what what can you do for me for this price other than I don't need a lot of bells and whistles. I need, you know, th there are just certain things that I need. And so one of the, that was, I mean, one semester class was good, but boy, it's like, it's just like when I went into hazardous waste management. Well, I didn't know how to write a damn hazardous waste transporter manifest. I didn't learn that in my undergrad classes and even my grad classes. So it's, there's stuff that you learn on the job and it's like, oh, maybe you should have more special librarians come in and, and talk for an hour or so about return on investment. Copyright in the corporate world versus yep. copyright in academia yep. and negotiating with vendors and how do you handle the hierarchy of a corporate world yep. and the politicking that sometimes goes on and the marketing. If you're going to be solo or even in a corporate world with another librarian, if you're not out there marketing and aggressively asking or assertively, not aggressive, assertively asking to help from other people or saying, hey, what can you marketing people do for me? I'm getting to know our new marketing person and we want to start doing videos of the library and, and all kinds of cool. things. So it's like. I immediately get in there and go, who's our new marketing person for the company or who does this and who does that? And I introduce myself and say, hey, you know, maybe you got something for me and I can do something for you. So stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I have to stress have the copyright for corporate because um, I am the corp the copyright SME for the company. Oh, my. Even our legal department oh, comes to me yes, and so. question. Yeah, and that just boggles my brain. Like for the world, like what the yeah. world? Um, so yeah, they, I had to really jump on, but I actually yeah. had to because things were happening before I got there. Um, I got tossed into a um a potential lawsuit. Ooh. So I yeah. had a year and a half of my first two years in the job was navigating um a very very expensive lawsuit threat for copyright cop um compliance violation. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it, you know, like you just never know when it's core value yeah. you're going to walk did, into. Jamie, did you, did you ever take the, the SLA certification in copyright? Um, I actually ended up doing something through um, Copyright Clearance Center, which that's oh, where we okay. get licensing through and things like that. So I did that and I'm going to be doing some other things over time as well. So, yeah, but I, it's, it's crazy. You would think yeah. that lawyers would want to answer those questions, but no. No. <laughs> well, I, I do. Right. They I are. Do. They are absolutely terrible at copyright. Yeah, I do also. Lawyers are sometimes the worst offenders. Oh, I'll subscribe right. to one newsletter and then make a zillion copies for everybody. Um, yeah. But our, our IP, our intellectual property lawyers, they're only concerned about Rolls-Royce intellectual yeah. property. Yeah. So when skin patent to use uh, when that. somebody needs to use something externally it's like oh i found the picture or i found this or can i make copies of that so we have a licensed copyright clearance center you know i i call it my insurance plan you know that's the insurance, insurance policy, policy. Right. Yep. and i took the sla copyright certificate course which was great you know i took the whole thing the certificate mm -hmm. program and I actually um, worked with one of our lawyers initially when I when it was just Indianapolis. And I go, what's their copyright policy here? I mean, it's like, and and yeah, and our other attorneys, you know, in our Washington D.C. office, they're like, no, no, no. and it's like, oh, oh, you're giving me the heebie-jeebies. But I, when I was <laughs> working in hazardous waste, I always said to people, you know, guess what? I'm not the DFI, and they go, what's the DFI? I go, I'm not designated for incarceration. You are, <laughs> you know, no. So, and then, but, yeah, I'm the copyright expert too. And, mm -hmm. you know, I like it and it's, yeah. And it's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's something that I never, I mean, you like, it's something that you know about, but to actually consider yourself an expert. Yeah, I know I'm right like, to say that, yeah. but I mean, that's really, I mean, and that's something else that I advocated for was putting copyright um, SME yeah. in my job description because yeah. that was something that had not been there before. 
and there was nobody in the company, a global yeah. company that was doing it. Wow. So, and then you have to understand the differences between EU, which would be European, right? Copyright, which is different, yeah. and then yeah. you know Canadian. China. China, they, no, you just leave it. They, they don't care about copyright. No, they are. That's what I know. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So it's like, you you know, like, and then if you're working with them and they're asking to share resources with, you know, everyone, it's like, you can't do that. Please don't do that. I don't want another lawsuit yeah. <laughs> because I don't, I, that's enough for one, one time at all. So, yeah. I used to negotiate lawsuits when, you know, in the hazardous waste business, you know, with the FAA and DOT, you know, and it's yeah. like, oh, you know, it's like, yeah, we have punished that person severely and mm -hmm. retrained them. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it's it's pretty hilarious. But what I do with copyright is because, especially with standards, because standards cost an arm and a leg. And then they're like, well, that's $300. I should be able to make several copies and give those to my coworkers or no. share those with my vendors. And I go, no, no, no. And then I go, it's their intellectual property. Just like we don't make one engine and say, oh, yeah, you can reverse engineer that and build your own. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then Good I analogy. go, and ethically, it's not the thing to do. I said, they work hard. That's their intellectual property. So I, and the easy way that I tell my, my engineers, and I try to do things simply, is if you didn't create it or Rolls-Royce didn't create it, let's ask permission. And then they're like, okay, got it. So then they ask permission. Cool. No, there was so much hand holding with respect to my feet in the here, right? <laughs> okay. It really uh, yeah. great things to be risk adverse and more, you know, aware. Um, well, we are at time, and I know, you know, folks might have reading for their courses to get to um are there any burning questions i can also if you'd like to email me i can also follow up with our panelists um but if everyone just has a few minutes um students any questions and um i put the link to the special libraries association in the chat um gabby you're the current president indiana fla indiana <laughs> well midwest <laughs> we're kind of merging I haven't done much of anything for several years, but I'm very involved in SLA in the solo division and engineering aerospace. Mm -hmm. And I go to SLA every year. I love it. It's, and, you know, and when I was studying to become a medical librarian, I got a uh, scholarship to go to MLA, not, not, yeah, MLA, yeah, in both Midwest and Fargo. That's where I met Buzzy Bash. Oh, rest in peace, Buzzy. And uh, went to MLA in Phoenix. So um, go to those conferences. Well, and this year, MLA and SLA they are fine. Yeah. their conference. So it's earlier than usual. It's in May and it's in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, uh, well, I'm going, Gabby. Jamie, yeah. are you guys going? Oh, Jamie and I are presenting. I yeah, we're going to be on all. I, yeah. Yeah, Lisa Weinberger. Like, yeah, she yeah. um in Austria, so she's yeah, yeah. So, with us. Cool. Um, but I am the current, now volunteered president of the Solo Librarian Community. So um, I'm leading two different panels for the conference for representing Solo Librarians. And Gabby is on one of those with me. Cool. So we'll be talking corporate library success yeah. stories. So that'll be exciting. <laughs> so, but I will just stress that I am more than happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Yeah, same uh, here. Same. It's here. not my It's not my bedtime yet. <laughs> you know, and and once again, if a group wants to come and visit, or even if you're an individual. Uh, I mean, it'd be nicer if it's a group rather than one-on-one -on -one all the time, but I can do one-on-one. -on -one. If you want to come to see my physical library and see the Parks Petting Zoo and see, you know, just one type of corporate library, I am open to visitors. Um, I just need to make, you know, a little bit of arrangements. And if you're a foreign person, if you're not U.S. or um, a... Uh, resident uh um permanent uh, what do they call that um then um i i have to 
Yeah, a green card holder. Then I they have to make I have to have you you know a security. I have to send that through security. We're a Department of Defense contractor, and who knew about all that export control stuff? Oh yeah, there's a whole nother ball game about export control and Department of Defense and all of that. We have a raised hand. Uh, would you like to um, unmute and ask? Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Yujo. I'm a first year MLIS student. Thank, Thank you, you for this very informative panel. It was truly eye opening. <laughs> um, I have one question because um, a lot of these special libraries, they serve very specific industries. So, uh, based on your experience so far, do you think having a relevant, you know, experience to those industries are critical to securing these job opportunities? No. <laughs> I'm no. I think it I think it would help. I would think and I think a lot of um like it'll say in the job posting if it requires a you know your your undergrad be a special um field. So like say if you're going to be a law librarian, I, they do encourage having some form of law education. Um it'll be very specific in there um in the job description if that is like a, you know, full mm -hmm. like a hard stop like you, you know, they but I would apply anyway. Yeah, because well, everything anyway, because you could talk your way into almost anything, yeah. and and then figure out the details after you have the job. Exactly. Right. Now, because yeah. I have a history degree and I work for a medical device. Medical, yeah. <laughs> I have a English degree. It, yeah, I work for bank. I, you know, you uh -huh. have to, on the job. You have to be able to say yes, I can do this, and pull any kind of vaguely mm -hmm. relevant experience, whether it's formal education or not. Usually right. it's not. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to know. I mean, I wanted to be a medical librarian because I was always interested in medical science, biology major, public health, all of that. But once, you know, it's like you can learn what engineers need to know. And what I did was the first year I was there. They had something called the Indy Academy. And these were like one hour, hour and a half, 90 minute courses that met twice a week, all about the company. And I just, I went to those classes somewhere, you know, like, well, that's way over my head. And, but I learned all about the company and all about the engines and our, I mean, it, they went through everything, not just gas turbine engines, but, you know, how do you, uh, the, uh, oh, just change papers, just all kinds of stuff. So I made it a point to really learn about the company, but I didn't, you know, when I came on board, I was like, well, I don't know what a labyrinth seal is versus a vein, you know, and it was the same when I worked in hazmat. I didn't know the difference between a roll off and a comp tank, but it's if you have a particular skill set, it's like, okay, I can find that information. That's what that's they what we know. do. We find information. Yeah, it yeah. Can pick up things like I can mm -hmm. spew off a lot of different ways to say titanium, but <laughs> yeah, but like you know, it's just like it's these things that you pick up. And one of my most proud moments where I finally felt like okay, I get it. I I know what I'm doing now. Was I had a literature search request that came to me, and it was needed for an audit. So. If you work for medical device manufacturing, you have FDA come to you to do audits. Yes. Yes. You also have the British standards industry come yep. to you to do audits. And so you need that right away mm -hmm. to be able to provide. Yeah. And I just did a search and I was able to include keywords that they had not provided to me. Yeah. And I did it without even having to do a second thought. Like it was so natural to me. And so like after the fact I gave them what they needed and I'm like, and they were like, yeah, that's exactly what we needed. I was like, <laughs> yeah, just that. It's like, I've done that too. So satisfying to have that happen. So I know satisfying. it's like, I don't know anything about small modular reactors. And I had someone in the UK ask me, you know, do a lit search on that. And sometimes, you know, the interview, it's, I have to do a reference interview. It's like, exactly what do you need? General or, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of, yeah. so then they'll say, okay, this is what I need. And then they're just like, this is lovely. And you're like, oh. you know, I don't know anything about small modular reactors, but after doing research, yeah, I know a little bit more, but it doesn't have to be your area of expertise. Sometimes that may assist you because 
you may, I end up giving them a little bit more than they might because if if I have too much knowledge, I may leave some stuff out and yeah. and give them some stuff that's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. mm-hmm. that's excellent. Thank you. All right, folks. Any other questions for those that have um, stayed a little over? Thank you so much. Thank you. If not, we'll let our catalyst retire for the evening. <laughs> and luckily, thank um, you. Thank you. Again, I will plug Special Libraries Association in the chapter if you're in Indiana or, you know, there, I know we have students all over. So there's probably a state chapter, um, you know, elsewhere. And yeah, thank you again. This was lovely. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting. And letting me chat, you know. It was great. Thanks, everyone. All righty. Take care. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Good to see you, Jamie. Good to see you, Mary D. Good to see you. And good luck, all students. (laughs) Yes. Good luck. You can do it. Yes. It's going to be a great, great job choice. (laughs) I did it at the age of 50, you know. (laughs) I'm still kicking it. All righty. Bye. Bye bye.